Uh, Jordan, the floor is now yours. Great. Thanks so much, Harley, for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for listening in today. Some of you might remember me from my presentation here last summer titled A Push-Button Astronaut, Isolation, Confinement, and Vigilance in Pre-NASA Spaceflight Simulations, which looked at a very early space medicine experiment conducted by the U.S. Air Force in 1958. If you like my talk today, you can find that one in the FISO archives. That talk was adapted from one chapter of my forthcoming book, Anticipating the Astronaut, about the early history of space medicine in the 1950s. I'm also currently working on a second book project called Putting Mars in a Jar, about the surprising history of military astrobiology in the pre-NASA era. As a historian focused on the human and biological problems of space exploration, my mission is to recover nearly forgotten stories from the dawn of the space age that can inform both present day and future operations. That's why I was so excited when Dan emailed me a few months ago, inviting me to talk about the overview effect, an important idea many of you are likely familiar with. It has gotten a lot of renewed attention recently with a flurry of private space flights this summer by Richard Branson on Virgin Galactic's VSS Unity and Jeff Bezos on Blue Origin's New Shepard. Overview narratives featured in their accounts of their brief experiences of space and framed part of the con conversation about the supposed benefits of space tourism. My talk today is based on an article I wrote back in 2014 when I was still a PhD student in Toronto, Canada. Rethinking the Overview Effect won the 2014 Sacknoff Prize for Space History and was published in the journal Quest, The History of Spaceflight. It remains one of my most cited and most read articles so far. That being said, it has existed as a sort of scholarly B-side, a non-album track not included on my two main book projects that I mentioned before. In the years since Rethinking the Overview Effect came out, I've been looking for opportunities to update it and to help it reach an even bigger audience. So when Dan asked if I'd like to adapt it into a talk for the FISO Telecon, I jumped at the chance. Earlier this summer, I had my research assistant, Giacomo Cetarelli, a rising first year here at University of Chicago, help by preparing a report, including the most recent scholarship out there about the overview effect. All of that is to say, thank you very much for having me back. I'm excited to be here. Now slide number two. Today I'm going to be talking about the overview effect, the idea that viewing the Earth from space results in a positive mental shift or perspective or worldview. This idea now has significant traction in spacecraft design, space psychology, space exploration advocacy, and public understandings of spaceflight and its benefits. When most people think of the overview effect, they imagine a natural phenomenon that produces the same results in all people. You get to space, you look out the window, you see the Earth, you have that experience. People now go to space expecting to have the overview effect and then report that they do. However, rather than a natural phenomenon that is the same for all people, I argue that the overview effect is a cultural experience, one of potentially many reactions of the view of Earth from space that is variable between individuals, variable between societies, and variable between historical time periods. To support this claim, that we are mistaking something cultural for something natural, my presentation will make three main points based on material from NASA and U.S. Air Force archives. First, I'll show that the overview effect has roots in pre-existing ideas about the sublime, about the whole Earth, and about manifest destiny. Secondly, I'll point out some major important limits to astronaut self-reporting in space psychology, which affect the first-hand accounts on which overview is based. And finally, I'll examine a nearly forgotten alternative to overview, the break-off phenomenon, a troubling set of negative mental experiences reported by military pilots in the 1950s. Together, I hope these will cast overview in a new light and open the door for more views alongside overview, a multiplicity of diverse cultural experiences and reactions to the view of Earth from space. In 1987, Frank White, an American aerospace engineer and author, coined the term the overview effect to describe a collection of positive mental experiences being reported by astronauts after viewing the Earth from space. His book, titled The Overview Effect, included interviews with NASA astronauts and laid out his interpretation of their experiences. Now slide number three. 
In a 2007 interview, White described the overview effect as, quote, that experience of seeing the Earth from orbit or from the moon and having a realization of the inherent unity and oneness of everything on the planet. It's a realization that we are all one in terms of our place in the universe and our destiny. It's a shift in consciousness, a shift in awareness and identity, and a harbinger of many more evolutionary transformations. In his 1987 book and its subsequent lectures, interviews, and related initiatives, Frank White made the case that the overview effect is a naturally occurring phenomenon, something special that happens between the Earth and the human mind, an inspirational and exhilarating shift in worldview leading to a newfound appreciation for the fragility and interconnectedness of our planet. But as the full title of the book, The Overview Effect, Space Exploration, and Human Evolution, suggests, he believes it is much more than a curious psychological perk of spaceflight. White uses his collection of astronaut tales to conjure a grand vision about humanity's purpose and destiny. For White, these reported positive mental shifts constitute a message, or a cosmic road sign, as one supporter of his put it, a message from the universe telling us we must pursue a future in space. To White, overview stories represent affirmation from nature itself that we belong in space and that humanity's purpose is to colonize the cosmos as quickly as possible. Now slide number four. For the book, White interviewed dozens of astronauts about their experiences viewing the Earth from space and cataloged these raw ingredients in an extensive appendix. I've included three examples here on the screen. The basic structure of a typical overview story is a conversion narrative that occurs in space and takes the form of a positive shift in perspective or worldview, a realization or aha moment highlighting peace, unity, and environmental stewardship. After the publication of The Overview Effect, White's idea that these stories described a pattern that reveals something deeply woven into the fabric of reality gained momentum with several key groups. Astronauts, along with aerospace workers and spaceflight enthusiasts, welcomed Overview as a utopian framework through which to celebrate space and advocate for increased funding and public support. Quote, it's the universe telling us we're on the right path, one supporter wrote. Who wants to disagree with the universe? Now slide number five. Within a decade, Overview had many true believers, including one in the White House. In October 1997, U.S. President Bill Clinton spoke about the overview effect in his opening remarks at the White House Conference on Climate Change. Quote, every astronaut since has experienced the same insight, Clinton said, and they've even given it a name, the overview effect. Now slide number six. The overview effect has gathered steam ever since and is now guiding spacecraft design, driving calls for larger windows through which to better trigger the process, and also shaping research into space psychology. Can Overview be a mental health support to astronauts in near-Earth space? Now slide number seven. Members of environmental and peace movements have also evoked the Overview effect as a revelation to justify whole Earth or borderless perspectives. Today, different groups are working to simulate the Overview effect right here on Earth, Recent studies from 2019 and 2020 recount efforts to trigger overview via immersive virtual reality simulations, with prospective target audiences spanning everyone from jaded politicians to impressionable schoolchildren. Some scholars have wondered if overview should be thought of as a religious or spiritual experience. But a recent study published last year found that while astronauts reported a significant increase in appreciation for the Earth, they did not report anything like a spiritual conversion. Now slide number eight. In 2008, Frank White founded the Overview Institute in Washington, D.C. to further popularize the idea, and there is no denying that he has been successful. White's concept of the overview effect has gained widespread popularity and is taken seriously by many different groups with different stakes in spaceflight. It is regularly depicted in arts and culture and circulates on social media in the form of memes and viral videos. The overview effect has become a dominant framework through which people understand the experience of spaceflight. People now go to space expecting to experience it, and then they report that they do. Following his shuttle mission, payload specialist Lauren Acton said, quote, I went up expecting that experience, and I had it. 
It's such a successful idea that in the era of private space flight, companies are selling it and people are buying it. At the press conference immediately following his suborbital space flight last month, Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos said, quote, The most profound piece of it, for me, was looking out at the Earth and looking at the Earth's atmosphere. It's this tiny little fragile thing. It's one thing to recognize that intellectually. It's another thing to actually see it with your own eyes, how fragile it really is. On the Space News website, space.com, this quote appeared under the simple headline, Bezos experienced the overview effect. My purpose today is to convince you that the overview effect is not a natural phenomenon and that there are risks in continuing to believe that it is. I believe that history shows that it is one specific cultural interpretation of a natural object, the Earth. This interpretation is a reflection of a particular set of values and goals unique to our moment, not a timeless signpost from the universe hurriedly beckoning us to space. The overview effect is culture mistaken for nature. It is one way mistaken for the only way or the correct way. This unintended narrowing of the myriad possible experiences down to only one and the claim that this is a natural thing poses significant problems and risks for future astronauts and spaceflight operations. People feel pressure to have an overview experience, and if they don't, if they feel something else, I worry that they default to an overview narrative anyway, because that is what they, are, they think they are supposed to feel. This problem can range from us simply missing out on a great richness of different cultural understandings of the Earth to a serious risk to astronaut mental health. Astronauts might conceal negative mental experiences for fear of appearing different, for experiencing something deviating from the accepted and expected overview narrative. My hope today is that I can contribute something meaningful to the important conversation Frank White started in 1987. White has done a great service to spaceflight by putting a spotlight on experience, studying it closely, and then synthesizing what it all means. Overview has inspired millions of people to become passionate about space and about the Earth. I do offer a different interpretation, but one that wouldn't be possible without Frank White getting this valuable conversation started in the first place. Now slide number nine. Think for a moment about your favorite piece of art, a painting or a song, a film, or maybe a play or a piece of performance art. If we share that work with a friend, we don't expect them to have the same reaction, the same emotional response or insight. We expect a range of interpretations, which is a big reason why art is so interesting and so valuable. It's a mirror for us, for our particular hopes, fears, and dreams. Now, instead of art, a cultural object, think of a natural object, something beautiful and stunning in nature, like a mountain, a forest, a sunset, or the ocean. Just like art, different people will have different responses to natural beauty and take away different meanings and interpretations. This is especially true between cultures and between time periods. Take the ocean, for example. To different cultures in different moments of history, the same ocean has meant vastly different things. Life, food, transportation, danger, exploration, trade, industry, fear, disaster, scientific research, resources, security, recreation, environmentalism, warfare, all from the same ocean. Human experiences and interpretations of the ocean clearly have changed over time and are variable between different cultures. There is no one natural or consistent way to be moved by the ocean. Why should the view of Earth from space be any different? Now slide number 10. This next portion of the talk focuses on precursor ideas to the overview effect to show that it doesn't just flow from astronaut reports. When Frank White crystallized and gave a name to overview, he was synthesizing, combining, and building on existing cultural ideas about the mind, the environment, and about settlement, specifically the sublime, the whole earth, and manifest destiny. Now slide number 11. The idea that viewing grandeur in nature results in a profound mental experience has a long history that we can trace back to Enlightenment-era Europe and an idea called the sublime. 
Starting in the 1700s, cosmopolitan Europeans, who became bored or disillusioned with rapidly industrializing urban life, escaped to the mountains, the Alps, and climbed up their dangerous slopes, places their ancestors had totally avoided. High on these mountains, these early climbers attained a new vantage point on nature. They could see the land at a new scale, as a massive vista far below them stretched out to the horizon. Their eyes took in more space in one view than they ever had before. They described their mental reactions to this novel visual stimulation as an addictive mix of pleasure and horror. Poets like Edmund Burke began to call this strange new sensation the sublime, noting that it was deeply personal and hard to pin down or describe. In 1756, Burke grappled with the sublime this way, writing, quote, The passion caused by the great and sublime in nature is astonishment. An astonishment is the state of the soul in which all of its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. In this case, the mind is so entirely filled with its object that it cannot entertain any other. The ingredients for an experience of the sublime seem to be a visual observation of something grand and potentially threatening in nature, but viewed from a safe distance. So in addition to mountains, powerful waterfalls, distant thunderstorms, massive icebergs, and other related phenomena seem to trigger this mental reaction in well-to-do European explorers and travelers. Complexity came from the coexistence of so many seemingly uh, conflicting feelings. There was fear, but also delight, grandeur, and insignificance, terror, and attraction. An overwhelming of the self, and yet a better understanding of the self through that. The most interesting thing for these writers was how these natural places and phenomena seemed to overwhelm and unsteady their sense of self and their otherwise rational minds with pure feeling. This became a hallmark of the Romantic movement in the first half of the 1800s. And here we can see one of the most iconic paintings of the German Romantic era, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich, depicting someone having this type of experience. Now slide number 12. In the 20th century, following World War II, humans began to get their first views of the Earth from space. The first photograph of Earth taken from space altitudes was snapped in October 1946 by a camera on board a captured German V-2 rocket launched by the U.S. Army from White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. Now slide number 13. In 1967, NASA's Applications Technology Satellite 3 took the first color photograph of the Earth appearing as a full disk in space. This image quickly gained currency in the 1960s counterculture movement and ended up on the cover of the famous Whole Earth Catalog. Now slide number 14. In December 1968, the crew of NASA's Apollo 8 became the first humans to orbit the moon. In addition to famously reading the opening passage from the book of Genesis on Christmas Eve, they took this picture of the Earth, which became known simply as Earthrise. Now slide number 15. Four years later, in December 1972, Apollo 17 astronaut and geologist Harrison Jack Schmidt took this famous photograph of the Earth, now known as the Blue Marble. Now slide number 16. In the overview effect, many of the astronaut conversion narratives that make up White's body of evidence include a common pivot point, the sudden appreciation of the whole Earth as a total system. However, this appreciation of Earth as a single bounded system is an idea that comes out of the Cold War. Beginning in the 1960s, scientists fashioned a number of ideas about the whole Earth as a total cybernetic system in service of the Cold War and the space race. Two ideas foundational to the overview effect are James Lovelock and Lynn Margolis' Gaia hypothesis, the idea the Earth is a self-regulating superorganism, and Buckminster Fuller's concept, concept of spaceship Earth aboard which we are all astronauts. Both the Gaia hypothesis and Spaceship Earth are cybernetic visions of the Earth as a closed world, a bounded system constantly undergoing processes of self-regulation. Developed during the Cold War, these images and models also have a deeply political dimension. They assert claims of American understanding, control, and mastery of the whole Earth at a global scale. Built on these foundational concepts, Overview subtly extends this default Americanist worldview into space. 
But beyond the apprehension of the whole Earth as a total system, the overview effect also includes a grand narrative about humanity's purpose and future. Specifically, White argues that overview is a signal that humans must colonize the solar system, the galaxy, and beyond. The combination of destiny, expansion, and settlement has roots in the idea of American Manifest Destiny. The 19th century doctrine, which held that European settlement of the Western frontier was both inevitable and morally justified. The grand narrative spun from overview extends this way of thinking beyond the earth. Human settlement of the final frontier is also inevitable and our inherent purpose. Western civilization, the first one on earth to develop a spacefaring capability, is then assumed to be the correct model to extend out into the cosmos through colonization. Put another way, Spaceship Earth is assumed to be an American ship. Even as White inspires readers to conjure a utopian vision of humanity devoid of cultural barriers like political borders, ethnocentric assumptions about American or Western superiority and colonial expansion lie just below the surface. Present in certain overview narratives is what I call the overlord effect. Claiming to have the overview effect gives some people the hubris that they have achieved a new level of enlightenment and are therefore entitled to speak on behalf of the earth and all of humanity about what is best for all of us. I especially worry about this with more private space flights on the horizon. Will a quickly growing pool of space flown wealthy elites claim an overview epiphany just to justify and naturalize their self serving projects? When we think of the overview effect as something natural, we not only forget the cultural history of the component ideas, the romantics overwhelming sublime, the Cold War's cybernetic spaceship Earth, American manifest destiny. We also naturalize and essentialize a certain political stance about what our goals in space should be, when in fact that stance and those goals should be wide open for debate. Now slide number 17. Now having examined some of the different precursor ideas which created the conditions for an idea like overview to exist in the first place, we turn to the astronaut tales themselves, the raw ingredients White relies most on. White assumes that because astronauts are carefully selected for their exemplary military or STEM backgrounds, that they are also entirely reliable reporters, speaking truthfully and accurately about what they really feel in space. However, since the dawn of the space age, Aviation and space psychologists have worried that pilots and astronauts habitually resist telling them the truth about their emotions during missions for fear that any negative or abnormal reports will result in being removed from flight ready status. In fact, right from the start, space psychology was a game of cat and mouse. There is a well-known story from the Project Mercury psychological evaluations in early 1959, where Pete Conrad was given a test called Make Up a Story. An Army psychologist named John K. Jackson showed Conrad different ambiguous illustrations, and Conrad had to make up a story explaining what was going on. As a curveball to the astronaut candidates, one of the images was left totally blank. Without missing a beat, Conrad deadpanned, it's upside down. Jackson made a note of this response, but when he looked back up, Conrad had produced his own pad and pen and was jokingly mocking him by observing and making notes about Jackson. Despite Conrad's well-known sense of humor on display here, this story shows that the first astronauts enjoyed messing with psychologists, and that this low regard for them was romanticized early in astronaut professional culture. As former NASA psychologist Patricia A. Santi has written, the expression of emotions such as sadness or fear is considered a weakness. Denial is the name of the game. In short, there is an insidious problem with self-reporting specific to spaceflight and astronaut professional culture that I call lie to fly. Now slide number 18. Ever since NASA astronaut Deke Slayton was bumped from a Project Mercury flight in 1962 for a minor heart defect, all astronauts have known that they are easily replaceable and that their careers in space depend on their continued presentation of near-perfect mental and physical health. You don't want to seem less normal or more complicated, because if you do, someone who seems more normal and less complicated might get your seat. In short, space psychologists assume that a subtle lie-to-fly culture persists and influences what astronauts will tell them. Why admit that you felt anxious in orbit when you can just say you had the overview effect? Why complicate a tidy narrative that works so well to promote a utopian vision of spaceflight? 
NASA's bureaucracy and astronaut professional culture has produced a situation where the astronaut mind and the spaceflight experience is a necessarily guarded one, a difficult one for outsiders to accurately access and analyze. NASA astronaut Al Sacco Jr., who flew on the space shuttle, described the overview effect as the astronaut's secret. Quote, once you get to space, I tell them about something I call the astronaut's secret. It's a realization all the astronauts have, which is that we are a member of the whole human family. It goes beyond being a citizen of the Earth. You are really a citizen of the universe. Once something like Overview has a name and gains momentum, it becomes both a self-fulfilling prophecy and a convenient catch-all cover story to hide abnormalities. The systemic lie-to-fly problem has serious implications for the evidence at the core of White's concept. The pattern that White is writing about may be the result of skewed and biased self-reports, now stuck in a feedback loop through the popularization and expectation of overview narrative types. If the previous section shows how wider cultural movements shaped overview, this section shows how astronaut professional culture continually regulates which types of stories can be told. In the context of future long-duration missions, this wider problem of removing barriers to honest self-reporting of mental and emotional experiences will be key. Getting a handle on the overview effect is a good place to start this conversation and search for solutions. Rather than perpetuating the idea that there is a right way to experience the Earth from space, we must create room for multiple interpretations across individuals, across cultures, and across time periods. Which brings us to our next item. Now slide number 19. Lastly, we turn to a nearly forgotten alternative to the utopian overview effect, a dystopian concept from 1950s aviation psychology called the breakoff phenomenon. This suggests the view of Earth from high up above posed a serious psychological hazard to pilots. In 1956, U.S. Navy psychologists were stunned to hear about something the pilots themselves were calling breakoff. They described it as occurring when pilots become painfully aware of leaving and being separated from the Earth's friendly environment and being alone in the hostile and limitless beyond. These reports prompted a focused study by cardiologist Ashton Grabiel, director of the Naval Aeromedical Institute at Pensacola and later part of NASA's Project Mercury. He interviewed 137 naval aviators about breakoff. He found that 35% admitted experiencing it. However, due to the same self-reporting problem just discussed, he guessed that more pilots held back, noting that many answered that it was, quote, very personal and, quote, not the sort of thing flyers talk about. Now slide number 20. Those who did talk reported feeling depressed, anxious, isolated, and separated from the Earth, connected only to their aircraft or to the black void above. Here are three quotes from pilots recounting the experience of breakoff. Quote, I have left the world. There is only my ship to identify myself with. And in this adrenaline inflicted state floats the feeling of detachment. Quote, it seems so peaceful. It seems like you are in another world. I feel like I have broken the bonds of the terrestrial sphere. Quote, he feels alone, light, remote, and insecure. He is unhappy until he gets to a lower altitude. He feels the need to have an important objective, to take his mind off of it. Two years later in 1958, United States Air Force space medicine expert David G. Simons spoke about experiencing the breakoff phenomenon during one of his high-altitude balloon flights called Man High 2. Simons noted that he did not experience the effect during his ground-based 24-hour claustrophobia test, but he did during his day-long flight, which took him above 100,000 feet. During this, he experienced feelings he interpreted as breakoff. Simons said, quote, I experienced a sense of detachment from the Earth at four separate times. During the night, I felt in much closer contact with the stars and space above than I did with the beautiful but remote clouds below. Simons, along with Grabiel, saw the breakoff phenomenon as a real threat to humans and vehicles. They worried that pilots, frozen in a breakoff spell, would fail to act at a critical moment. This disturbing prospect of a military pilot experiencing breakoff during a mission was dramatized in the 1959 post apocalyptic novel Alas Babylon by American author Pat Frank, in which the United States falls under atomic attack. 
The trigger point for the nuclear exchange includes an American pilot experiencing breakoff while on patrol over the Mediterranean. Quote, he felt alone and apart from this transformation, wrote Frank. It was as if he watched from a separate planet. A 1963 article titled Mental Effects of Space Travel linked breakoff explicitly with astronauts. The author described it as, quote, a laziness of mind, a drifting away from the Earth and its meaning. The author warns that an astronaut experiencing breakoff could, quote, become susceptible to influences over which he can exercise no power. But after a few more studies in the 1960s and the 1970s, the breakoff phenomenon disappears from medical and popular literature, absorbed into problems of spatial, spatial disorientation and fear of flying. In the context of the overview effect, the breakoff phenomenon represents an older dystopian idea that is currently displaced by White's grand utopian conversion and colonization narrative. Few recall a time when looking down at the earth from high altitudes was scary and fostered feelings of separation and isolation rather than feelings of epiphany, human unity, destiny, and communion with the whole earth. The breakoff phenomenon reminds us that human experiences of environments and natural objects are never fixed and are not the same for everyone. Unlike White in the overview effect, naval psychologists investigating breakoff never cast it as a conversion experience or read any kind of grand pessimistic narrative about human destiny or purpose into it. For example, they might have concluded that breakoff was a sign from the universe saying, stay on the ground. Now slide number 21. By historicizing overview and examining its origins, implications, and alternatives, we can see how it is not a natural phenomenon that is the same for everyone, but rather a cultural experience of a natural object specific to our current moment. It is not that I think the overview effect isn't real. I believe many astronauts really have come away with those thoughts and insights. It's that it comes from us and not from nature. We make it real, not the universe. Overview is an all-too-narrow view of the myriad ways humans can interpret a view of the Earth. Moving forward, we should view overview experiences as products of history and culture and make room for different experiences and different interpretations, too. Specifically, we must find ways to address and remedy how it currently displaces and discourages other feelings that astronauts likely do have while in space. So what's the solution? The first step is education and awareness. Denaturalizing overview can break the cycle and make people feel okay about not experiencing it and reporting something different. Explaining to space travelers, space professionals, and the space-minded public that there isn't one natural or correct feeling to take away from views of the Earth will create the conditions for openness and honesty that I fear overview has inadvertently closed off. Learning that the overview effect is a cultural view with a specific historical origin and that it has been amplified by social pressure and astronaut professional culture and that radical alternatives to the overview effect have already been documented by military pilots provides a foundation for progress in this area. I hope the result of this education and awareness will, will be not only a richer culture of spaceflight, but a more honest, open, and realistic approach to mental health in space. When we mistake overview for natural, we also naturalize the grand vision that space exploration and space settlement is humanity's inevitable destiny. This masks the reality that space is a series of choices. We chose to go to the moon. We choose to explore Mars and maintain the International Space Station. Conceiving of space exploration as mere destiny, as merely our rote mechanical fate, weakens us by disguising and downplaying our own agency. Space is better for everyone when we see it as a choice, as a chance, as possibility. We have the power to choose which future in space we want. Now slide number 22. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you also to Dan and Harley for organizing this important and valuable series of talks. If anyone is interested in reading more of my work, I'll quickly mention two recent articles I have out, one dealing with space medicine and the other with astrobiology. My article, Andean Man and the Astronaut, Race and the 1958 Mount Evans Acclimatization Experiment, has just been published in the journal Historical Studies and the Natural Sciences. And 
examines early U.S. Air Force space medicine experiments with high-altitude indigenous people in Peru. On the topic of astrobiology, I've co-authored an article with sociologist David Reinecke at Princeton about exobiology's repeated failures to find life on Mars. It's titled, Sustaining the Search for Life, the Maintenance of Ambiguity in Martian Exobiology Following Non-Detection Events, and it has been accepted for publication in the journal Social Studies of Science and will be out very soon. Feel free to email me at the email address listed on the presentation slides if you are interested in receiving a copy of either paper. Thank you very much again for listening. I'm happy now to take your questions. Great. Jordan, that was terrific. That was a lot of fun. I have two questions. This is Harley. I'm the moderator, so I get to ask the first question. This is there will be two of them pretty quick. You, you Throughout your talk, you were referring to, for what it's worth, I think it's quite appropriate, that there are you know, different cultural views right now. It's, quote, unquote, dominated by Western views of, exploration, manifestation, blah, 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 blah. Has there been a, um, so the first question is, has there been any um, more detailed study, something that you couldn't mention or didn't have time to mention, that in fact demonstrates that different cultures, you put them up in the, in the same location, I know mainly the astronauts have been Western or Western-oriented uh, backgrounds, but have there been studies, um, quantitative studies, of uh, the difference in uh, apprehension of where folks are in space as a function of their culture. First question. Second question is real quick. Um, has, it, has there been any um, reliably documented, um, I don't know, um, damage, shortcoming, failure, what or something negative uh, that uh, has happened to an, uh, in space that has happened to an astronaut or that an astronaut caused due to say, the overview effect? Great question. Uh, so first, the, the answer to your first question is, is no, I don't believe there are any, um, any like, quantitative studies of non-Western astronauts and looking at their experiences of space flight uh, as a function of, of, of culture. And this is something that I would 100% uh, think should, should be happening. Um, it's one of those things that, that's difficult, though, uh, to break through the sort of uh, self-reporting problem that I mentioned before. Like, how can you be sure that what they're really telling you is what they're really feeling? It's hard to sort of pierce that, um, that, uh, that pressure that they feel to conform and to be unproblematic, uh, employees. Uh, you know, we've all felt some degree of that in our jobs and they feel an extremely exaggerated, uh, a version of that. So I think both these studies need to happen, but we also need to figure out a way for there to be a framework that opens up, um, uh, people's ability to talk uh, freely and openly about what they feel. I feel like there, there's um, a dangerous risk going forward that uh, will disguise and mask our problems into an even bigger catastrophe. So that's the first part. Uh, the second part, um, uh, has anything negative happened in, in space because because of the overview effect? And, and yeah, I, I have not come across any, any anecdotal evidence of that. Uh, if anyone on the call has heard of anything, uh, I would love to hear about that because um, uh, that, that could definitely be something that I add into a future uh, permutation of, of this of this work. Thank you for those questions, Harley. Okay, great. Thank you, Jordan. Do, do other folks have questions? Yeah. yeah uh, oh, quick question. Uh, Philip Lewin, you see uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, that was a great talk, Jordan. Thanks so much. Um, the, the one uh, area uh, that I'd be curious to, to get your thoughts on are you know, if, if we close our windows, um, we can be in our own virtual reality, uh, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's, you know, through electronics, VR, or um, just, you know, by being in a room. We don't know that we're traveling through space, you know, at the moment, which we are at high speed. Uh, we're just connected to our planet. Um, I'm wondering whether the, sing the singular person in space and the pilot versus the collective um, is a relevant differentiator in terms of reaction to seeing oneself as different um, in different environments. In other words, having sort of the friendship of, others, friendship of others or the tasks from others keeps one, you know, in a healthier mental state. I mean, I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. And, you know, I'm coming to you as a, as a Canadian currently trapped in the U.S. Uh, due to the pandemic. I've been essentially isolated since December 2019. Uh, so I, I do, I, I take this question very personally, and I, I think you're right. There is something very different 
about um, being alone versus being part of a group. And I think that definitely would impact your experience of a natural uh, of natural surroundings, especially, you know, the view of Earth from space or being out in, in sort of, um, you know, uh, deep space, uh, that, that would be a, a huge difference. I, I think the, the singular person, the person who is alone, uh, has to deal more with themselves and introspective problems. Um, you know, there, there is sort of a lack of stim- stimulation, a lack of, of, of uh, enhancement that comes from uh, interacting with other humans and sharing an experience. So rather than just uh, experiencing something and have it kind of running on a hamster wheel in your brain, uh, when you share it with another human, when you can talk about something in real time and, you know, figure out what it means, that leads you to a different place than if you're sort of just dead ending on, on yourself all the time. So uh, I think there is like a really important distinction there to be made, um, for, uh, for the singular, um, experiencer versus the, the, uh, the small group experience or the population experience as we get larger and larger populations uh, into space, having these types of experiences, that type of scaling from the individual to the small group to the population, that will be key in both managing these types of experiences and also understanding kind of what 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 more is out there other than the overview effect. So I think that's just a wonderful question. Thanks for asking that. Good one. Okay, do other folks have questions? Yeah, Jordan, this is, this is Dan. Um, I, I really liked your sort of historical perspective on what you could call an overview-like emotion. That was back on your slide 11, where you have somebody standing in front of some, you know, extraordinary landscape, looking out in an amazing view of the world and seeing the world in a different way. Um, how similar is that to the canonical overview idea i mean is that is that really a a a, a, a is that really similar or what how does it work I, I believe it's a direct precursor and uh what's what's interesting is because you know that feeling which which is called the sublime uh you know that is specific to its historical moment that comes out of you know the 1700s European industrialization, this, this feeling that, uh, the cities are oppressive and people want to get out into nature and have these natural experiences. They start climbing mountains. They have these new views that they've never had before. That sublime, which is that mix of sort of pleasure and horror that they get from these wide open expanses, that feeling of danger, but also danger at a distance. Uh, that is, that is very specific. That, that is like, uh, a sort of overwhelming transcendental experience that has that sort of dim- that social and cultural historical dimension to it because it's happening in a specific moment in a specific place. And so I feel like the overview effect is just like another further down the line permutation of that, a different expression of that that contains its own historical and political particularities because it's coming out, you know, in 1987 towards the end of the Cold War. You know, this idea that we look to the earth and we see unity and we see peace you know, that betrays an anxiety that the earth is, is divided and is not at peace. And when we look at the earth and we see its fragility, that betrays an idea, a knowledge that, uh, you know, we are destroying it. And you know, we think of it as fragile because we worry that we're breaking it. So there are these, um, the, these uh, dimensions to uh, these experiences that are very particular, and they definitely reflect our social and political historical moments. And this is the reason why I think history can be such a helper here, because it can kind of help us parse, you know, what is sort of the natural experience and then what's sort of the cultural um, layer to it that's really specific and that we need to kind of be able to apprehend so we can get a good sense of what's really going on. Well, you know, it's really interesting. When you're talking about the sublime, you referred to it as providing either pleasure or horror. And in respect to horror, are are we talking about a break-off-like phenomenon where you're looking out at something so different that you don't even feel that you're a part of the regular world. Is there any historical evidence for that kind of thing? There, there is, yeah. And, you know, I, I think there is a, a bit of an echo there to the break-off phenomenon as, as well, because, you know, the people who are experiencing sublime, these European travelers in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, they felt this overwhelming of, of the self. And it was a really introspective experience. Like, you can look at that that painting, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, that I showed, and there's that singular human there looking out. And, of course, it's the environment that creates that feeling. But for them, it was really about the internal uh, the internal feeling, their sense of self that was 
you know, at that point, so rational, and yet now overwhelmed, that troubled them deeply. How, how could my rational mind be sort of set, um, you know, um, awash by, the, by, by, the, by emotion, by sensation? So to them, it was a very internal, very um, inside their own self and inside their own head experience, sort of less connected to uh, the exterior surroundings than, say, the overview effect is where, where you do contemplate the planet and you do care about the, the, the um, stewardship of the planet in a very uh, uh, particular way. So I think there, there, there is really interesting um, connections to be made to both of these things, but each one is, a, is, is sort of a, re a reflection of its own particular cultural and historical moment. That's the really cool and interesting thing about each one of these is that you can look at them and you can see the, you can see society, you can see historical problems and things that were going on in that moment in, in these expressions. Okay, yeah, that is very interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, this question, uh, Steve Brody here in Arlington, Virginia. Um, thank you. I, I joined the, the uh, presentation a bit late, but I've looked through all the slides and, and enjoyed the last 30 minutes or so. Um, this may sound, I'm trying to combine a little bit of humility with hubris, and I'll see if I do that. But I wonder if in your experience, it seems to me that the overview effect isn't that different from those of us who have maybe at a young age through exposure to visions of the planet from afar, maybe through Apollo or, or through a heightened sense of, of, uh, that we're all in this together through, you know, I did a lot, quite a bit of international travel in my younger days. Uh, and, and then seeing things like Star Trek, you know, the, the utopia of, a of humanity come together. Uh, you know, uh, it, voyaging through the universe. So my question is, is the overview effect, did, is it really, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, too, too narrowly identified with those who quote, experience the earth from space as opposed to those who maybe break out of a more narrow focus on maybe a nationalistic portrayal of, of how they fit into society and become more uh, human, I would say, a more uh, a member of the same species, uh, us earthlings, so to speak. Steve, thank you. That's a, that's a really, really good question. It gives me a chance to talk about something that I wasn't able to get to uh, in, 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 the, in the, the paper. But it's this, this idea, you know, I've been working on the, on the history of the overview effect for, you know, almost 10 years now. And one thing that sort of always keep, I keep coming back to in my mind is like this idea of why do we have to go to space to have these revelations and these insights? Uh, you know, why does it take Jeff Bezos uh, having to, you know, build his own rocket and fly to the edge of space? to somehow, you know, learn what you could learn just from reading a book or talking to people or looking at pictures of the Earth from outer space, uh, which is, yeah, the planet is fragile. We need to take care of it. You know, uh, we're all humans and we shouldn't let, um, you know, borders divide us. You know, these are not things that you need to go to space to understand. So I feel like in some respects, the overview effect sets too high a bar, you know, metaphorically and physically to, uh, to sort of gain, gain these insights. And I think another thing that happens then is that people who do go to space and do come back with an overview story, uh, you know, we imbue them with a sort of aura of like having um, having gone to a special place and achieved a special knowledge. And that, I think, um, you know, is a reflection of older ideas about the heavens, about the cosmos as a place where, uh, you know, it was inhabited only by powerful beings, gods or angels or uh, types of, uh, of beings that had, you know, superior power and superior knowledge. And we treat people who go there and come back as having a bit of that aura still. We haven't quite made that, um, that sort of pre-modern and modern division, um, you know, as sharply as, 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 I would, as I would like. You know, we still sort of think that, oh, they've been to space so that they must have some really special knowledge or special insight. Uh, but they're just coming back and saying things that we can learn here on the ground. Uh, so I think that that's like a, a sort of a simple, uh, it's, it's a simple point, but it's one that sort of my mind just keeps coming back to. Like, why, why do we have to go to space? to have these insights and have these revelations. Uh, we should, you know, be able to uh, reach these conclusions, uh, you know, right here uh, from, from sea level. I agree. Thank you.
Thank you. Other questions? Other questions, folks? we got a, got a, a few minutes left on our regular schedule. Other questions? So my name is Gordon Andrews, and I work for the Johnson Space Center NASA. I've been there for 40 years. I'm a video producer, and I produce a TV show called Down to Earth, and it's based on Frank White's work. We interview astronauts all the time. We have a, it's a, if you go to YouTube, you can see Down to Earth and then NASA, and it will bring up our library. We just put up 19 new episodes. Uh, we've done a 30-minute documentary. We interview the astronauts when they come home from space. We like to get them like five days after they get back. That seems to be the best time to interview them when it's the freshest on their mind. We've interviewed international astronauts, uh, uh, Sergei Krikalev, uh, Hazal Mansari, uh, uh, Luca Pramitano, and uh, I would say that it's not an American cultural experience. I'd say it's a human experience because their interviews are all very similar. Uh, we're actually a new new process we're doing right now is we're call, doing what we call uh, astronaut logs, and it's where they sit in front of a camera while they're in space and they actually talk about their experience as they're experiencing it. So it's a much more contemporary view. I will say that a lot of the interviews that Frank did in his book were sort of pre-ISS, and the interviews if you interview astronauts that were shuttle and pre-shuttle, uh, their experiences were completely different than the astronauts that are on board the ISS for six months at a time. Uh, and uh, you can tell by the interviews that their experience is very, very different. I have never, in all the interviews that we've done with astronauts, never interviewed anyone that's had the break-off experience. In fact, it's just the opposite. Um, we do put them in teams. They do work in teams. And um, they all represent or uh, report uh, positive experiences. They all have some sort of an interview, um, an overview effect, but they describe them in terms of their own experience. So it does cause a shift for them, uh, but it's, it's just like if you or I went to Paris, we'd all come back with different stories, five different stories, so it's just described differently. But there is some sort of a shift in awareness in that. So. A lot more contemporary information out there on the overview effect that we're collecting every day. Every mission, we just did one with Victor Glover, uh, Mike Hopkins, Chris Cassidy. So we get them right when they come home, and we ask them about these experiences to understand better the psychological phenomenon that they've experienced. It's a good presentation. Thank you, Gordon. You're yeah, thank you so much, Gordon, for that that uh, that comment and uh, for the perspective of 40 years uh, of work on this. You know, it's really valuable. Uh, I'm definitely going to check out Down to Earth and uh, look at some of these interviews that you've been collecting. That's really valuable work, uh, you know, creating a record of all these different uh, experiences like that that's accessible so easily. So thank you for that comment, and thank you also for, for your work. I really appreciate it. Let's see. Did Harley disappear? Yep. No, no. I'm here. Oh, oh you're oh, there. I, okay. <laughs> Silence for a moment. I was going to let somebody else come in with a quick question. And, Jordan, so I'm going to ask one. While you're talking, I mean, the, the analogy with Manifest Destiny was was interesting and persuasive. I'll tell you the truth. I, uh, Of course, I've heard about Manifest Destiny all my life. So I decided while you were answering other questions, I was, well, of course, listening, I decided to read about Manifest Destiny. Um, on uh, on Wikipedia. So about 90 seconds later, I'm now an expert on manifest destiny. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the points that was made up near the front, which actually I thought was interesting, I kind of think I knew this, that in real time, that is in the mid um, 19th century, more or less, there are a number of prominent Americans who who uh, were aware of the arguments and the philosophy and the attitude of that manifest destiny, who bitterly opposed it. Um, I, I didn't know this. U.S. Grant, Abraham Lincoln, as two examples. Um, mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, did so in parallel with with your studies? Did you? I know you said that you found folks who really kind of didn't think it occurred. That is the overview effect. Did you find anyone who um, thought it, thought it was really you know just just bull? It doesn't really exist. Nonsense. Um, get over it, guys, gals. Uh, let's get on with, with your job. Is there any any um, substantive opposition? 
Yeah, there, there is, um, the thing about the overview effect is that it's really easy to find people who are incredibly passionate about it and, and supportive of it. It's much harder to find people who are critical of it. And myself, as a critic, it's been difficult for me to parse my position because I don't want to just say, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, say that, like, you know, these experiences are, are bad or we should get rid of the overview effect uh, in, or that it's not real. I, I believe it's real. I believe it's valuable. Um, I just think we should lengthen the shelf so that beside the overview effect, we can put some other possible uh, understandings and, um, and and experiences of it. One critic I can point to uh, right off the, the bat is Stephen J. Pine, who's a historian, and he was one of the very first people to review the overview effect. So when I was doing my research, I looked back uh, to who was reviewing the book right after it came out in uh, late 1987, and um, and he was one of the, the, the critics who really, um, you know, he, he took a far more critical stance than I ever would. Um, so he was one of the lone critics that, that I could that I could find in terms of manifest destiny and those famous uh, critics who, who push back on, on that, you know, that idea that, you know, um, European settlers were sort of justified and, and that the um, the expansion westward was inevitable. Uh, you know, I, I think that applies to the overview effect in, in, in the sense that, like, you know, we shouldn't think of going to space as fulfilling a destiny or. Um, as recapitulating something that's preordained or or prescripted, you know, I think it's much more interesting and more uh, fun, and I'll, I think just more true, truthful to go to space thinking that this is a choice that we make as as a species, as different uh, organizations and countries. This is a, a series of choices that we make, and that gives us more agency. And I think that's more exciting because we can choose and we can define what type of future we want in outer space. We don't have to just think. Uh, okay, you know, the overview effect uh, is linked to an idea that we should colonize the, the solar system and then the galaxy and then, and then beyond, um, and that's sort of, like, already there, and we just have to, like, walk down that path. I think it's more fun and more realistic and uh, probably, you know, more just and ethical to cut our own path and to say we are doing this. We are choosing to do this. There is no one who says we have to do this. We're doing this because we want to do this and because we are going to make a series of choices that makes – space exploration and settlement in outer space work for us on our terms. So I think it's really interesting to push back on that sort of, uh, you know, space is our destiny um, uh, idea a little bit here. And I think the overview effect and its history is one of the ways that I can sort of push back on that a little bit and say, why don't we choose to go to space rather than say we're fulfilling our destiny and going to space? Great. Good. Good point. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again, as you see, as you can see from the questions, a terrific presentation, and I guess you'll be coming back in a year from now. You're, you're an <laughs> annual visitor, an annual, annual presenter to us, and we'd love to have you back. It was a ter terrific presentation. And so, folks, it was, it was, it was, yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. I yeah. would just say it would be my pleasure to come back uh, anytime. Uh, Dan and Harley, uh, thank you so much for, for having me. It's, it's always a treat to speak to this incredible audience of uh, space professionals, People who have, you know, real skin in the game. It's, 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 it's absolute pleasure for me to get my research out to, uh, you know, the actual practitioners. So I, I really, really appreciate this opportunity. And thank you, thank you to the organizers and thanks to everyone who tuned in to listen. Okay, good. Thank you. That's very kind. So talk to you all, um, next Wednesday at the same time. Everybody in the meantime, take care. <laughs>